Hello, this is Mario and welcome to Awesome Audio. In this video, we will talk about acoustic quality tests. There are many ways to quantify the quality of an electroacoustic device such as a speaker or a microphone. Some of these tests are more complex and specialized than others, depending on the application, but the most common are the frequency response, the sensitivity, and the total harmonic distortion. We must consider that since there are no perfect speakers or microphones, they will be able to reproduce or capture some frequencies better than others, depending on how they're designed and built. This is why there are headphones with better bass response than others. The frequency response test consists in introducing sine waves of different frequencies, but all with the same amplitude into the system, and taking note of the amplitude with which they come out. Next, a curve is drawn with the obtained data. For a speaker, this means introducing electric signals with a sine wave form, varying only the frequency, and measuring the acoustic wave they produce. For a microphone, it would be the opposite. Sine waves are used because we already know that any other waveform contains harmonics, and it is more trustworthy to do the test with a signal as pure as possible. These tests are done in an anechoic chamber, which is a room whose walls absorb sound. This is because if we had normal walls, sound would be reflecting within the room and that would interfere with the test, especially when testing speakers and microphones. Listen to the difference between clapping in a regular room, opposed to what it sounds like in an anechoic chamber. It is also important to do these tests in the same conditions in which they will be used by the consumer. For example, headphones like these sound very different if they are pressing against the ear than if they are slightly separated, so the test must be done in these same conditions using a head and torso simulator like this one, which has a microphone inside the artificial ear and also accounts for the resonance within the ear canal. Let's recall that when we talk about frequency ranges, it makes more sense to use exponential increments than linear ones, especially when human perception of frequency is involved as it happens with audio devices. So, in a frequency response test, exponential increments are used. We can also think of it in the sense that a 1 Hz increment is much more significant in the order of the 100 Hz than in the order of the 10,000 Hz, where an increment of 1 Hz would be so small it would hardly even be noticed, while exponential increments are equally significant in any range. However, this also makes the curve harder to plot since increments in low values are very small and increments in high values are very large. To compensate for that, a logarithmic scale is used in the frequency axis. As you can see in the image, as we move towards the right, increments take up smaller space, so further on larger increments are visualized. For example, these divisions show increments of 10 Hz, but in this section 10 Hz increments are so compressed that we change to increments of 100 Hz. When having a curve with exponential increments and an axis in logarithmic scale, we obtain equal separations when plotting the points. As we mentioned in the previous episode, we also perceive amplitudes in a logarithmic form. This is why decibels are used for the resulting values. The main purpose of these graphs is not to plot the actual voltage or pressure values that are produced, but simply to compare the device's response to different frequencies. For example, when seeing this voice microphone's frequency response, we can see that it is very deficient when capturing low frequencies. Do not use voice microphones for low frequency instruments. Frequency response is a spec that we can usually see on the box or in the technical sheet of speakers and microphones. However, sometimes they don't include graphs and they only express the numerical range in which they have a good response without really knowing what magnitude they used as the lower limit to define a good response and also it doesn't inform us of the response variation within that range, but at least it is a clue regarding its performance. Sensitivity does have to do with the proportion between the output signal and the input signal, that is, how large an output is with a certain input. In microphones, sensitivity typically is the voltage produced with a stimulus of 94 decibels SPL, or 1 pascal, which is the same thing, while for speakers it tends to be the sound in decibels SPL produced with a 1 watt input, measured at 1 meter. However, as we observed in the frequency response curves, this proportion will depend on the actual frequency, so sensitivity is usually expressed for a single frequency to maintain this spec as a simple number without the need of making a curve, and is usually only useful to get a general idea of the output-input proportion. In audio, this frequency is usually 1 kHz. Before we talk about total harmonic distortion, we need to talk about what is distortion. A distortion is a modification in a waveform other than only modifying its frequency or its amplitude, that is, a modification of its actual shape. We already know that modifying the wave's form also modifies the frequency spectrum. 
so a distortion will usually add harmonic or even inharmonic components or modify the frequency and amplitude proportions between the already existing components. In music, distortions may be used interestingly to create new timbres, like in electric guitars, but in quality tests of speakers and microphones, they are undesirable as this means that the device is modifying a waveform which we would rather have the device reproduce as faithfully as possible. But again, no device is perfect, and they will all induce a distortion no matter how minuscule. The total harmonic distortion test consists in introducing a sine wave, that is, a pure tone, which shouldn't have components other than the fundamental, and then we measure the spectrum of the output signal, which will probably have other spectral components due to the deformation of the wave. Here, the distortion of the output signal is defined as the percentage of energy found in components that shouldn't be there, relative to the total energy of the signal. Mathematically, this would be the sum of the magnitudes of all components except the fundamental, divided by the sum of all components including the fundamental. This gives us a percentage which at the end is the total harmonic distortion. However, let's recall that this procedure was done for a single input frequency and would correspond to the distortion at that frequency only. Distortion may be larger or smaller at other frequencies, which is why this procedure is repeated for all other frequencies for which the test is being done, and again, this generates a curve. Just like in frequency response, sometimes you will only find a number for the total harmonic distortion. This indicates that the total harmonic distortion in most of the audible spectrum will be lower than that quantity. I say most because it is very common to have high distortion at low frequencies. The electronic components used in circuit design, as well as the physical construction, including the device's dimensions and materials, will all have consequences on the frequency response, the sensitivity, and the distortion. With that, we conclude this episode. In the next one, we will talk about the working principle and different types of loudspeakers. If you enjoyed this episode, you may hit like, leave a comment, or share to those interested. For more content like this, you may also subscribe. See you in the next video.